All right, so in this video, we are going to try to tackle the entire French Revolution in one go. So this is going to be a very condensed version of the French Revolution. Uh, I will also post in here the longer version of the French Revolution, which is over the course of, I think, three or four videos. Uh, so if you want more French Revolution, I can give you more, and I will link those videos into, into the module as well. But this is our one video condensed French Revolution attempt. So the French Revolution is something that comes out of the American Revolution. And there are going to be a lot of causes and effects from the American Revolution in France. Uh, another thing that we might want to keep in mind as we're thinking about the French Revolution, if the American Revolution is more about John Locke, the French Revolution is a lot more about Rousseau. That's not to say that there wasn't a little bit of Rousseau in the American Revolution and there wasn't a little bit of Locke in the French Revolution, but if we're thinking about who is the philosophical leader of these revolutions, it's probably John Locke for the Americans and it's probably Rousseau for the French. So to get started, Let's talk about some long-term causes. These are things that happened, causes. These are things that happened well before the American Revolution, and these are things that are causing big problems in France uh, that's going to cause the French people to want to overthrow their government. The first, is the tax structure. In France, there were three official social classes. There was the first estate, and estate is just the French word for class. The first estate were the clergy, the church people, and there was really a very small number of them, about 0.3% of the population. The second estate, or the second official social class, was the nobility. And of them, there was probably about 4 to 5% of the population. And then the third estate was everyone else. And they made up roughly about 95% of the population. There's two big issues here when we're thinking about the tax structure. The first and second estates owned about 50% of the land. But almost all the taxes were paid by the third estate. So the tax structure is inherently unfair. The first and second estates didn't really pay taxes, and almost the entire burden of taxes in France were paid by the third estate. Another long-term cause is that, as you remember, France is an absolute monarchy.
an absolute monarchy is really expensive. And France is always kind of broke. But especially after the loss in the Seven Years' War. So France was always kind of broke, but they were especially broke after they lost the Seven Years' War because they lost a lot of their trade routes to the Western Hemisphere to the British. So they're not really making a lot of money. They're losing a lot of money because absolute monarchy is expensive and they are spending a lot of money they don't have. So if we think about the short-term causes, the stuff that's happening right at the beginning of this, there's two. Two that, that are going to be important for what we're going to do here in a second. The first is the Americans did not help the French after the American Revolution. Remember that they were supposed to give the French, or the French assumed that the Americans would give them the trade routes that the British used to have, but the Americans gave those trading rights back to the British. Okay, so that's one short-term cause. Another short-term cause is that a bunch of French soldiers went to the United States to help in the war and came back with revolutionary ideas. Remember how in the last video we said that it wasn't a great idea for the French to do this because you're teaching people how to overthrow a monarchy? Well, this is, this is the result of that. But the biggest, most important short-term cause is that funding the American Revolution bankrupted France. They are completely broke. And remember, they assumed that the Americans would give the French those trading rights, but they didn't. They thought they were going to make up the money they spent helping the Americans gain independence, but they didn't. So now they are broke. Really broke. So the only solution to France's problems is to raise taxes. But we can't raise taxes anymore on the third estate. So we have to start taxing those guys. They have money and they're not paying taxes. But just like in England, in order to issue new taxes, we had to call the French version of Parliament, which was called the Estates General.
And this was called in May of 1789. Now, the Estates General isn't quite like a parliament. Every, there, there were, I believe, 1,200 members of the Estates General, but there weren't 1,200 votes. Each estate gets one vote. Each estate gets one vote. So when the question comes to the floor, should we raise taxes on the first and second estate? The result is going to be two to one against new taxes. Even though everybody has been telling anyone who will listen, France is broke and the only way we're going to be not broke is to have new taxes. The first and second estates don't want to pay any new taxes. And so it goes around and around and around for quite a while. And then finally, the third estate had enough. And on June the 17th, 1789, the third estate decided they had enough. And they declare themselves the National Assembly. Like, we're going to start doing this stuff on our own. We are 95% of France. We don't really need the rest of you to make these decisions. They find on June the 20th, 1789, that they've been locked out of the big meeting room for the Estates General. So they go find another room to meet in. And that other room they meet in happens to be an indoor tennis court. And here they take the tennis court oath. And basically what the tennis court oath says is that they will write a constitution for France. And it is at this point that the king of France, Louis the 16th, agrees to these new conditions and orders everyone, meaning the first and second estates, to join the National Assembly. And they get to work writing this constitution. And the first big document that comes out of this is called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. which we will helpfully abbreviate as the 
Doromac. And this document is kind of like a combination Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence. It's going to follow in the footsteps of the English Bill of Rights and the American Bill of Rights. And it declares that France is now, maybe not independent, but they are definitely now a constitutional monarchy. And in this, you're kind of starting to see some hints of Rousseau coming through. People are just doing stuff. This is not gradual. This is not uh, measured. People are just doing stuff, and it's happening. So all of this stuff kind of sounds a little bit like Rousseau. And so between 1789 and 1791, things go pretty smoothly. We get that constitution. And Louis acts as the executive. And he works with the National Assembly. Same as like they do in England. Louis is the executive, just like the British king is the executive. He works with the National Assembly, just like the King of England or the King of Great Britain works with the Parliament. Same thing. We're going to abolish all the old kind of medieval laws that had been in place. We're just going to get rid of them and start over. We're going to make the church part of the government. There was a lot of corruption in the Catholic Church in France. And so part of getting rid of the old order is making the church get on board with all of it. But in 1791, things take a radical turn. And some historians consider this stuff to be a revolution all on its own. So you might consider this to be the first part of the French Revolution, or you might even consider it to be a revolution all by itself. 1791 causes a new revolution to start. So the thing that makes this turn happen is that Louis, who seems like he's okay with all of this, actually hates being a constitutional monarch. And he's going to try to flee France. And he's going to try to get to Austria to meet with his brother-in-law, Anne. 
and topple the revolution. The funny thing is, though, he fails and gets arrested along with his whole family. So Louis, the king, is in jail. Well, not jail. House arrest. Also in 1791, the other European powers start to take notice And they issue the Declaration of Pilnitz. And basically what the Declaration of Pilnitz is, is it says, put Louis back on the throne or else. And in response to that, France declares war on Austria and Prussia. And because the king turned out to be a traitor, France needs a new government. So France is going to become a republic with no king. So, at this point, we get a new legislature, so we get a new parliament called the National Convention, and we get a new executive which is actually a group of people. And it's called the Committee for Public Safety. So instead of the National Assembly, now we have the National Convention. Instead of the King, we now have the Committee for Public Safety. And the guy running the Committee for Public Safety is a guy named Maximilian Robespierre. Now, this new government has two goals. First goal, win the wars. Second goal, defend the revolution. For the first goal, they are going to do this thing called the Levee on mass, which is basically a universal draft. And so the French army swells. It is huge. And so they're going to win battles.
based on sheer numbers. At least at first. And we'll talk more about the Levee on Mass probably tomorrow in the next video. The other thing, which is the thing that the French Revolution is most famous for, is defending the revolution. And to defend the revolution, we are going to resort to terror. And so we're going to get a massive wave of political executions. Anyone that could be accused of being against the revolution was arrested and beheaded via the guillotine. Beheaded. And at the top of the list, Louis was executed in January of 1793 and his wife, Marie Antoinette, was beheaded in October of 1793. So this period of time is known as the Reign of Terror. I don't know if you can hear the rain outside. That is just a happy coincidence. So this is where things get a little bit more extreme. So in addition to beheading people who were against the revolution, we're also going to attack the church, which was also against the revolution. And so we're going to see a big effort to de-Christianize France. So we're going to uh, use church buildings for other purposes. We're going to create a whole new calendar. In order to get people to forget when Sunday was when you'd go to church. And we're also going to try and fail to create a new religion and I'll put that in quotation marks, based on reason and logic. It doesn't really work, but they're going to try anyway. Now, this period ends when Robespierre attacks too many of his political allies, accusing them of being not virtuous enough. 
And to tell you the truth, Robespierre might have kind of had a mental breakdown. Because up to this point, he had been pretty reasonable and logical, but now he's kind of going off the rails. And so in August of 1794, Robespierre was arrested and beheaded, which ends the terror. and ushers in a new period with a new government. Called the Directory. Now we're not going to talk too much about the Directory. One, because we're out of paper. But secondly, because the Directory really isn't all that important. The Directory... brought a little calm back to France. But they were hopelessly corrupt and ineffectual. They really couldn't get anything done. And that's when we're going to bring into the story where we'll start on our next video, the directory was overthrown by a really famous French war hero. And his name, Napoleon Bonaparte. And we will start our next video talking about what Napoleon does and what the rest of Europe does in response to Napoleon. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.